songs, Father? which I... Yes, son. I want to kill you. Well, that one, I know what he's talking about. But some of the Mother, other ones... Not so I much. I want to... <laughs> Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records. And this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome, if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, here on my channel, over on my Instagram, and on TikTok. Yes, I'm finally on the Clock app. This is episode two of the Vinyl Monday Spooky Series. Woo! This is the second of three weeks of my hand-picked autumnal favorites, best for playing between The Harvest Moon and All Hallows Eve. We're not going so much for literal Halloween vibes, except for next Next week, that is absolutely going to be literal Halloween vibes. I don't know about you, but I've always felt this week's album had kind of a supernatural vibe to it. That's why it's so good for playing at this time of year. We are talking about The Doors self-titled. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls so you can pick what goes on here sometimes. That's how we ended up with the spooky series in the first place. You should check it out, it's a fun time. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a repress from 1970, at least that's what the run out on my wax says. The cover doesn't have the Gold Records Awards sticker, so I'm thinking this was a case of uh, putting this record in a sleeve that was in better shape. So let's talk about this cover art. On the front we have this iconic photograph by Guy Webster with the equally iconic Doors logo in green, designed by Bill Harvey. He designed the logos for a lot of those Electra Records groups. This is a surreal, seemingly impossible perspective of Jim with the rest of the band behind him. And that's because it is. This is a composite shot. This lighting simply wouldn't be possible. Guy knew Jim from UCLA. He hadn't seen him for a couple years, and then he just turns up to his photo studio with this band. Jim was wearing a ribbon shirt, very hippie style, and Guy thought he had this Jesus look about him, so he had Jim take the shirt off for a few photos, and that's what we got on the cover. Then we have this back cover photographed by Joel Brodsky. I always thought it was interesting and a bit odd that two such similar photos were taken by different photographers. Of course, all of this was designed by Bill Harvey. This self-titled record was the world's introduction to The Doors. Jim Morrison on vocals, Ray Manzarek on keys, piano, some bass, and this wacky thing called a marxophone, Robbie Krieger on guitar, and John Densmore on drums. We have a special guest on this one, Larry Nechtel of the Wrecking Crew plays the bass. The Doors were produced by Paul Rothschild and engineered by Bruce Botnick. We really should get to calling Rothschild, Botnick, Jack Holzman, and Bill Harvey the Electra Mafia. I'm gonna start that anyway. The killer awoke before dawn. He rolled the transition on. <laughs> and walked on down the hall. After Ray Manzarek's old group he played in with his brothers fell apart, the doors just sort of fell together. This story is the stuff of rock and roll legend. I'm sure you've heard this before. Ray bumps into one James Douglas Morrison on Venice Beach. They knew each other from film school. Jim told Ray that he'd started writing songs, busts out a few lines from Moonlight Drive, and it's a done deal. Now Jim was not born Jim at all. 
He shapes his persona through being in the doors, and that's exactly what it was, a persona. I like to bust out this text sometimes. This is the Shake It Up anthology. It's got a lot of great rock and roll essayists featured in it. Before Eve Babbitts was a writer, she was a groupie on the Sunset Strip. I find this work of hers instrumental in humanizing the man of the hour. The human aspect of rock and roll is central to what I do, so let's allow Eve to introduce us to Jim through this excerpt from Jim Morrison is Dead and Living in Hollywood. Jim Morrison had it worse than a lot of kids. He was fat, and his father was a naval officer. Then the ultimate dream of everyone who weighs too much and gets thin happened to Jim. He lost the weight, and he turned into the prince, into John, Paul, George, and Ringo, into Mick. I met Jim early in 66 when he just lost the weight and wore a suit made of gray suede, lashed together at the seams with lanyards and no shirt. It was the best outfit he ever had, and he was so cute that no woman was safe. He had the freshness and humility of someone who'd been fat all his life and was now suddenly a morning glory. He really never stopped being a fat kid. He used to suggest, let's go to ships and get blueberry pancakes with blueberry syrup. Jim was embarrassing because he wasn't cool, but I still loved him. It was his mouth, of course, which was so edible. Just so long as he didn't smile and reveal his two Irish teeth. Just so long as he kept his James Dean smolder, it worked. But it takes a lot of downers to achieve that on a full-time basis. And no fat. My sister and her boyfriend lived with Jim and Pamela, and it was almost impossible. He was always a very dark presence in a room, she said. In fact, if you asked me today the feeling I got, I'd say it was of a person who was severely depressed, clinically depressed. She's now a psychologist. She knows. He thought he was ugly, she said. He'd look at himself in the mirror trying on those clothes, but he hated looking at himself because he thought he was ugly. Even his voice was embarrassing, sounding so sudden and personal and uttering such hogwash in a time when, if you were going to say words, they were going to be ironic and a little off-center. Jim just blurted things the f*** out. As a former fat kid who got thin and then didn't know what to do with themselves, I still look in the mirror and don't quite see what the rest of the world sees. Um, I absolutely believe what Eve and the people who surrounded her and Jim at this time had to say about him. Through gigging, cutting a demo, and word of mouth, the Doors land their first residency with jazz drummer John Densmore and their new guitarist Robbie Krieger. They are now the Doors. This institution was way less classy than the one we associate The Doors with today. They played the London Fog and were often on the bill with strippers. The Fog was instrumental to The Doors' development as musicians, though. I imagine this audience was a lot more willing to let the guys iron out the kinks in their set. Jim builds up his confidence as a frontman, the guys established their synergy, and they refine two of their signature numbers, Light My Fire and The End. In May of 66, they're moving on up and become the house band of the famous Whiskey A Go Go. They often share the bill with Van Morrison and his group Them. And now, Jim Morrison has taken shape. This was the Jim that one Pamela Ann Miller met during her groupie days on the Sunset Strip. You might know her better as Pamela DeBar. Miss Pamela specifies she never slept with Jim, they only kissed, he lectured her for doing some crazy hallucinogenic the bassist from Iron Butterfly gave her. As many women as he entertained, Jim's heart only ever really belonged to another Pamela, Pamela Corson. That is one comparison I will never see. <laughs> Now, there were some great house bands of the whiskey. Gypsy was one of them, but they never really did anything else. We may never have known about The Doors had love 
not handed them to Electra Records on a silver platter. I mentioned this last week in my Forever Changes episode, so as promised, here's the full story. Love signed with Electra back in 65. They were the only label willing to let the band own their masters, but they got off on the wrong foot with Electra. Arthur Lee wasn't 21 yet when Love was offered the deal, and he lied on the contract. Jack Holtzman finds out this fact nullifies Love's entire contract. Jack is pissed. From then on, Electra just kind of refused to promote Love, which was a huge problem. You see, Love was the first integrated band playing the Sunset Strip club circuit. They had a devoted local following, and they could have been huge nationwide. But they were an integrated band. When Electra sent them on tour, clubs in the South wouldn't book them. If Love was promoted better, they could have relied on other regions like the East or the Midwest to make up for the loss of the South. But Electra just kind of didn't bother. In their youthful naivete, Love thinks that if they give Electra another band, they'll be released from their contract, and they know just the guys to do it. The timing is a little too perfect now that the Doors have been released from their contract with Columbia. They couldn't get their sh** together to find a producer for the record. Arthur tips off Jack Holtzman and Paul Rothschild to their little brother band over at the Whiskey. They go to a gig on August 10th, but Jim's, well jimming all over the place. He's too drunk to perform and makes an ass of himself. So Arthur has to get the Electra Mafia out to the whiskey again and beg the other three doors to please keep Jim sober tonight. They try the whole thing again a few nights later it goes off without a hitch. On the 18th, Electra signs the doors, and all of three days later, they got fired from the whiskey. Wouldn't you know it, Jim got drunk and ranted through the end. Of course, Electra does not let love go, because that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. They keep love, but give them even less promotional and studio resources. The doors are about to make it big, Jack Holtzman is laughing all the way to the bank, and Love have just shot themselves in the foot. Production for The Doors starts almost immediately at Sunset Sound in Hollywood. I don't know how they got into the studio so soon, I could have sworn they cut this thing in the fall. It took about a week total to record I Looked At You and Take It As It Comes were the first songs to be completed, but this week, this week was eventful as fuck. The thing about Sunset Sound is it was an echo chamber. A literal, actual echo chamber. This is to benefit the singer with only four track technology available. You need all the help you can get to make those vocals pop, to make them as full as possible. I imagine the guys got all of one take in before Paul banned the wah-wah pedal from Sessions. Now we get to the song that earned this record's place in the Spooky series, The End. It was and is a trip on all fronts, writing, recording, and hearing it. The back half of the song is famously Jim going full-blown theater kid and retelling the story of Oedipus Rex. He worked on a production of the play at FSU. Since then, he'd become obsessed with the idea of kill the father, f*** the mother, not in the literal sense, oh my god. To boil the frog as best I can, kill the father meant kill the institution, f*** the mother represented going back to nature, but please take this with a grain of salt. I'm not even sure Jim knew what Jim meant by that. The thing about Jim is as much of a bookish nerd as he was, as much as he struggled with his self-esteem, he was completely unable to regulate himself. He'd have these episodes most of the time on stage, Sometimes not. Most of the time inebriated. Sometimes not. One day in the studio, 
he is tripping absolute sacks. We are beyond tripping balls. He's tripping sacks. And just going down this rabbit hole surrounding the end, he has an acid freak out, throws a TV, gets sent home to sober up, breaks back into Sunset Sound in the middle of the night, and trashes the place with a fire extinguisher. The damage was billed to Electra. Once Jim got his head on straight again, the doors went back into the studio to cut the end. In just two takes, Jim thoroughly wore himself out in those two. He didn't feel like doing a third, so the second is what we hear on the album. Indian Summer and Moonlight Drive were recorded, but didn't make the cut for the track listing. Indian Summer was cut for sounding too much like the end. The track listing of The Doors self-titled goes as follows. <laughs> God, the nationwide alert system stopped my filming. Fuck the US government, for real. Opening up side one, we have Break On Through to the Other Side, followed by Soul Kitchen. Then The Crystal Ship. Next, 20th Century Fox. Then Alabama Song with the subtitle Whiskey Bar. And side one closes with Light My Fire. Opening up side two, we have a cover of the Willie Dixon tune, Backdoor Man, I Looked At You, then End of the Night. Next, Take It As It Comes, and the album closes with The End. The Doors put out their debut in January of 1967. The record was done and ready for a November 66 release, but Jack Holtzman postponed it by two months because apparently the holiday season is a bad time to release an album. This didn't get the chance to hit number one. It was a slow climb to number two, blocked by who else? The Beatles. Delaying your album by two months only to be cock-blocked by The Beatles nine months later is so funny to me. Still, The Doors' debut was huge. How huge? Just about nine months later, when... The follow-up rolled around. This was in part a response to Sgt. Pepper's, by the way. Self-titled was still charting. Even though they missed out on the number one album, Light My Fire was Elektra's first number one single. The lead single, Break On Through, didn't do as well as they'd anticipated, even though it was the perfect length for a single. Never underestimate the seven-minute song, I guess. Of course, the end was used in the opening sequence of Apocalypse Now. Something tells me an avid reader like Jim would have appreciated one of his songs being used in an adaptation of Heart of Darkness. By way of The Doors' success, Elektra transformed themselves from a folk label into the cool label, the label that the edgy bands signed with. This had a very high yield, as we see from The Doors. But it will prove to be a double-edged sword with... A high yield comes a high risk. It's difficult to understate The Doors' influence, really. Jim's flair in particular has influenced everyone from Iggy Pop to Patti Smith and even Lana Del Rey. This remains a landmark debut album in rock and roll history, that which influenced another all-time great debut. Ian Curtis of Joy Division was inspired by Jim's writing and changed his singing voice to sound like him on Unknown Pleasures. Oh man, you should see my floor right now. You know this is an important album when I have to pull out like 10 records from these stacks. Anyway, what do I think of The Doors? <laughs> Going in, as I've done more of Vinyl Monday, I've ironed out my Doors album rankings. Strange Days is number one, I Will Die on That Hill. Number two is LA Woman, and a close third is self-titled. I find it hilarious that The Doors have the reputation of being cool rock music for cool, intellectual people, because if you actually listen to The Doors, you'll find this is rock and roll made by nerds for nerds.
nerds for crying out loud, they're named after literature. The figurehead of the band is the fat kid turned hot person, sure, but the center of the band is a keyboardist. That is so uncool. Geeks listen to jazz. <laughs> What set the doors apart in my eyes was not Jim's writing. It wasn't even that certain something that his persona had. That was a key part of the equation, sure. But what makes the doors different musically is Ray. Ray played three roles in this band. His keys filled the spot that a bass normally would, his solos are stuff a lead guitarist might play, and when Jim was too blasted to go on stage, Ray would sing. You took Jim out of the last two albums, and yeah, things got pretty weird. Spirits. <laughs> But the reason the Doors have stuck around for so long, that's Jim. The Doors aren't the most accessible band musically. In my eyes, loose composition with jazzy elements are generally not made for radio. But Jim remains a fascinating character, and mysterious people were made for rock and roll. They're what draw people in. They're what make people buy the t-shirts. It shocks me that Break On Through wasn't the breakout hit of the record. It was practically Frankenstein to be a hit. First you have John doing a bossa nova thing on the drums. Bossa nova had just had a big moment in jazz. You've probably heard something from Get Gilberto, it's in my other record cabinet. I do have it, I just don't feel like pulling it out right now. That was one of the best-selling records of 1964. This consciousness of jazz trends is indicative of John being a jazz drummer. Then you have the guitar riff, which Robbie has admitted he lifted from the Paul Butterfield blues band arrangement of Shake Your Money Maker. Three things. One, I've listened to that song like six times in the past 24 hours. I love it. Two, I'm a fucking dumbass for not buying that Paul Butterfield record when I saw it. And three, I also dig the Fleetwood Mac performance. Jeremy Spencer's voice was sexy and I'm tired of pretending it's not. Back to break on through, Ray is literally playing what I say. That's the same. Everything about this is electric and that energy is carried into Soul Kitchen. I have to say, I didn't think much of this song until I overheard my college roommate watching the Umbrella Academy a few years back and I went, oh my God, that's, that's the doors. I really don't want to wear this word out because it applies to so much of this record, so I'll just tack it on to Soul Kitchen. The Doors knew how to groove. It was groovy, baby, yeah! This song has my favorite lyrics on the whole record. Your fingers weave quick minuets, speak in secret alphabets, I light another cigarette, learn to forget. Love is a game of strategy, baby. Next is Crystal Ship, a gorgeous little song. It's unusually quaint for this album. That piano flickers like candlelight. Is it bad that I like 20th Century Fox because it's me? Can I even be a 20th Century Fox if I was born in the back half of the last year of the 20th century? A lot of Jim's lyrics are vague, some to the song's benefit, like Break On Through or The End, and others to their detriment. 20th Century Fox is a lot less vague. Uh, it stands out in a sea of waffling. Jim is rattling off all the ways this dream girl is cooler than him. She refuses small talk and has so few cares in the world, she doesn't even keep a clock. The keys act like the bass on this song, so we get fiery lead work by Robbie. Alabama song is such Bullshit. I love it. I am sick of hearing Alabama song is the worst Doors song. This delightful, delicious mess being worse than anything on Waiting for the Sun? You're a liar and a coward. There's a whole video essay on the significance of Alabama song. Polyphonic did it. I'll just say 
This is one of my weird favorites. I haven't had a sip of alcohol in months, but I put this song on and I just feel drunk. The oompa 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 sticks me in front of a funhouse mirror. And as soon as that marxophone, whatever the f kicks in, I have sea legs. I know we hail the doors for Jim's writing ability, but I wonder how it must feel to be Robbie Krieger. He wrote a handful of Doors songs, and in that handful were like three of their greatest hits, the biggest of which being THE Doors song, Light My Fire, which has only the most iconic use of a Vox Continental of all time. Sorry, Alan Price, but check out that hidden riff behind those iconic keys. What did Jim even do on stage when the other guys were soloing? Read the paper? Make a cup of tea? Take a nap? Oh my god, wait, he'd literally take a nap. You can tell there were jazz musicians in this band. Light My Fire is structured like a jazz number. There's a central motif, the frontman drops out for the solos, extended jams, returns to the central motif at the end. A Love Supreme does that, Take Five does that. This tune really reminds me of Take Five for some reason. And Jim is singing jazzy. Young Jim had this velvety, rich quality about his voice. For the love of God, I just want to be doing B-roll before it's dark. The interplay between Ray, Robbie, and John, how their phrasing would weave in and out of each other was so special. Maybe another hot take. Backdoor Man is unreasonably good. I was having a bad day when I listened through this one at the beginning of the week. Bad day like not even 20th Century Fox or Light My Fire could cheer me up. Bad. Like, those are two of my favorite Doors tunes and they never fail to pick me up. Until Backdoor Man came on, sometimes I forget how much of a blues girl my rock and roll escapades have made me until a cut like this comes on. I love how naturalistic this song feels, catching Jim's ad libs in the beginning where he sounds almost werewolfish. His yelps and this voice crack right there. It feels off the cuff and cool. Here we get a glimpse into the crystal ball of Fat Jim's future. A gruff, husky blues man weathered by whiskey and women. John Lee Hooker reference! Something about I Looked at You feels like the doors captured live. Like, you have the little ending, they take a beat, and then they repeat the chorus. It feels like they're in front of their audience at the whiskey, right? They do the fake out end, and then they wait a beat, and then they play the chorus again, and the room goes, ah! They could have done that like five or six times to keep the crowd going. Listen to that bass line. The bass often gets forgotten on Doors tunes because, well, they were the Doors that didn't really need a bass most of the time. When they chose to feature bass, it was intentional. But oh boy, those lyrics. They leave much to be desired. End of the Night is transcendental trippy magic. The track doesn't really go anywhere, but it doesn't have to. You can lift the curtain to see whatever lies behind it, but you can't actually go in. Take It As It Comes is utterly forgettable, which is a shame because Ray's fingers are on fire. And finally, the end. What is there to say that hasn't already been said? This is Robbie and John's moment to shine. John's drums, they roll and crash like thunder or a breaking wave. This is an all-time great Jim performance. He was an actor, a true showman. He did what only the greatest rock and roll frontmen of all time could do. He tapped into some kind of cosmic something beyond us. This isn't Jim here. This is Jim as a vessel for something else. I do prefer when the music's over 
slightly. I think that closer is structured a little better, but I still really fucking love the end. They're two of the best album closers in rock and roll history. I'll never forget the first time I heard the end in the bedroom of the apartment I lived in my senior year of college. It wasn't a very wide room, but it was a very long room. When I heard this one, I just stared at the mirror at the end of my room into a mirror reflecting the Woodstock poster I had hanging behind me, and it felt like I was staring into another dimension's past. I was also not sober for, like, most of college, so that could explain it. Strange Days, if you ask me is the better record, but, but it's tough because there's so many great Doors tunes on here too. But with Strange Days, Jim's songwriting had vastly improved over less than a year and they were experimenting more with production. There's still a certain charm within the roughness of self-titled. It's one hell of a debut record still. Instead of traveling to these whacked out places, we dream them up. The doors here exist within the mind. There's a different energy here. Dark, smoky, and I'll say it, spooky. This is best enjoyed like a seance, in the dark with candles and incense. This was made to lift the veil between reality and whatever is beyond us. So conjure at your own risk you might tap into whatever the doors did. My personal favorites on this one are Break On Through, Soul Kitchen, Light My Fire, Backdoor Man, The End, and f*** it, Alabama Song. If you want to keep up with all of my faves from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it! That was the Vinyl Monday Spooky Series Part 2. That was... The Doors self-titled. What do you think of this album? What do you think of The Doors? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. Remember, no matter what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you guys so much for watching and... I'll see you next week. Bye.